Uh, welcome, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Sheikh Abdul Salam Cultural Center. Uh, uh, so today we're going to be, um, today I'm going to be hosting a talk with Ms. Al Baydoun, and she's a professor, uh, an English professor at Kuwait University, as well as a instructor. health coach. Instructor, not instructor. professor, yeah. <laughs> My apologies. Sorry. And also, so, and, um, and also, and throughout that talk, we'll be talking about how to live your life in a healthy way, and also about a, a, a bit of that. So uh, I would like to welcome Dalal to today's talk, and the floor is yours. And for anyone of you who have questions, please feel free to share them in the comments box. And I will mention that, and we can answer that throughout. Definitely. OK, thank you, Sara, for having You're me. Welcome. Um, okay, so we're going to start by basically saying uh, just the understanding of the, the my name, Heal Thy With Thee. So just to start off with that, um, I believe that for everybody to become the healthier version of themselves, they need to heal themselves. And it has to be healed within. So this is how I really love the word healthy and split apart is also to heal thy uh, so that's how i uh, came across the the name that i truly fell in love with so to move on today we're going to talk about getting healthier through the covid time and healthy is really a long journey ahead it's a journey sorry that's my boo boo <laughs> Um, getting healthy is a very long journey ahead and it's a journey we need to realize that has no end. It's, it's growing and um, really figuring out who we are through this journey, uh, figuring out ourselves through wellness, uh, what success is and truly trying to find our deep happiness. And that sometimes sounds very simple, but it truly is the hardest to identify to some people. Um, to try and simplify the best that I can, what healthy is. And the major aspect that is so simple, um, when you're looking at it from abroad, it's, it's, it's a simple um, topic, but when you really look at it, it's actually a very complicated and hard road for a lot of people. Um, so we're gonna try to simplify this just by a few chapters in five minutes. So let's start before COVID, as we know, absolutely crazy. So I just wanted to just remind everyone where we were right before this all happened. Our life before was very, very fast paced. There was no time for sit down meals. It was very on the go aspect. And when we talk about on the go aspect, we're talking about on the go foods. You're talking packaged, processed, high in calories, very low in nutrients. Um, people walked around with major symptoms thinking that they were normal. Um, headaches, acne, mood swings, bloating, heartburns, etc. cetera. Um, and not many were truly understanding and taking a pause to really look at the, the root problem of their issue. Then COVID happened. And for the very first time in history, life paused. And during this pause, you had two types of people. You had the people who made a difference for themselves and the ones who didn't. <laughs> and the ones who made a difference for themselves, they started feeling a lot better. Um, they had more energy, less sluggish. Um, and I can simply ask you, Sara, why do you think this happened for some people? Why do you think there were some people that actually started feeling a lot, whole lot better? I think a lot of the times people started eating no, more no healthier answer. options Sada, and just started cooking. Yeah. Uh, I okay. believe people started I cooking more because, me. is that lagging? All right, so moving on, the reason behind this was there was more home, okay? All right, so yes, 
you're absolutely right. There was a lot more home cooked meals. Not just that, there was more rest, less stress, um, more mindfulness, more movement. So all of this led to people feeling a whole lot better. And for the ones who didn't do much, that's not an issue because at the end of the day, there is absolutely no wrong time to start getting better. So when, let's start from diets. Let's start looking at this as a whole. Let's begin with diets. Now, a lot of people... I'm just going to wait for Dedal because uh, unfortunately the, the connection cut off for a bit. Right? Sorry about that. But as we know, sometimes no in this country can go really bad. So my question to you is, where was the last part you saw where it started glitching so I can get back there and just continue from there. It was after the home cooked meals. I logged a okay. bit there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go down to the home cooked meals. Sorry. No worries. All right. Here we go. Okay. So we said that what is the what is the way um, that people started feeling better is that, like you said, Sarah, is that there was a lot of home cooked meals happening. And not just that, more people were resting, they were more mindful, there was more movement and a lot more self care going on for themselves. Um, and then you had the ones that didn't really make a difference uh, for themselves. And that's not an issue because there is absolutely no wrong time to make the right decision. Um, and all you need to do is just be aware about it and take that leap forward into deciding to take uh, make a change for yourself. Now, let's move on to diets, all right? So let's get into that journey and seeing and how to get ourselves better. Nowadays, a lot of people are at war with their foods. Um, they always are trying to figure out what kind of fat diets do they need to go on? Is it vegan? Is it paleo? Is it keto? Low fat? High fat? No carb? It's, it, the list is endless. And on top of that, it's not only the types of foods or the type of diet they need to go on, they also have to think about their genes, their metabolism, their age, dietary preferences, and their beliefs as well. And this is very, very stressful to a lot of people, all right? If you do not understand your body and what it needs, this can cause a lot of stress, and that's why you have bad relationships with food for some people. And the most important thing is that people really need to take uh, they need to listen to their body. And when I mean listen, I really mean taking a step back and listening to what's going on. So I'll give you an example. Your body gives out warning signs, all right, when things are going wrong. And when I mean by warnings, I go back to forms of inflammations that are headaches, mood swings, bloating, heartburns, allergies, and so on and so forth. These are not normal symptoms all right they should be looked at and um, you need to take a step back and realize that there is a reason that your body is giving you these uh, signs and that absolutely no warnings should go ignored uh, at all because as we know that inflammations in your body um, that are caused by nutritional deficiencies, food allergies, um, they can lead to other types of uh, serious diseases. So just as a question for you, Sara, do you have any allergies that you know of? I know that I'm um, hypersensitive to certain foods like pistachios or peas or almonds, so I try, I try to stay away from them as much as okay. possible. Okay, so you have... Them. You have uh, immediate nut allergy um, allergies, like so. Immediately after you eat your nuts in a, or a day or and two, you actually a, feel something. It's not immediate response. It takes like a day or a few hours. It's not like a severe allergy. So, okay. For instance, we have 
um, a lot of people are allergic to foods that they have no idea that they're actually allergic to them because you don't get those types of immediate responses or like, you know, you swell up um, and it's very obvious that there's something not right. Um, there are types of allergies that can happen throughout time. And I'll give you an example. Uh, people are allergic to or have an intolerance to dairy and they don't actually know that it's it's from the dairy. So what kind of symptoms would they have? They'd have acne, they'd have bloating, um, they'd be, they'll feel very sluggish and have really low energy and they would never connect the um, these symptoms with food allergens. And this is something that a lot of people need to be aware of and that if you feel any of these symptoms, you need to take a step back and do an elimination diet where you remove all forms of food allergens from your diet. Um, so this is something that should be spoken out loud because these are forms of inflammation. These reactions are inflammations. Now, inflammations, there are two types of inflammations. You have the endogenic. The endogenic is like we talked about, the types of food that you're putting into your body that is causing a reaction that you do not really uh, know that it's from the food itself. Headaches, um, heartburns. So the list is endless. But you also, we also need to understand that there's other forms of inflammation caused by other aspects other than food. And this is called exogenic. So you can't see it here, but it's called exogenic. And these are types of um, allergies, not allergies. These are types of inflammation caused by things outside of your, uh, your body. So let's, for example, if you're exercising you're not exercising much or you're exercising too much. Some people get shocked when I say, you know, you're over exercising, this can actually harm you. It's actually a very uh, true thing and it, it actually really exists. You're talking about stress. Unfortunately, one of the biggest killers out there and yet people till this day are not realizing what they need to do um, to, to manage the stress levels. And you have hidden, um, allergens from the environment itself, like in your indoor space, if you're using toxic products to clean your home, unfortunately scented candles, they actually can be very harmful, and uh, air fresheners. So these are things that can cause inflammations uh, from your surroundings. Now, if you do not listen to your body and you don't take steps to trying to solve these symptoms that are coming to you that seem like everyday symptoms, um, your body can go into, um, it can create an underlying disease that's more serious down the line. And one of these diseases that are, it's very known, it's the biggest symptom of inflammation is actually obesity. And obesity is the combination of endogenic and exogenic, um, what you're eating in your environment around you. So this is something that a lot of people need to be aware of um, when we're talking about uh, inflammations. So moving on, <laughs> what does one need to do to start getting onto that healthy journey of theirs. Um, and it's always really important to start from within. And when we talk about going within, we're talking about your gut. Um, the gut is a place where, as you know, it's where the bacteria live, the good, the bad, the fungus, all of that. And it's in your digestive tract. And the more we feed our gut thriving, good, healthy microorganisms, the more we humans will thrive, have a clearer mind. We won't be as bloated, have a strong immunity, which is something we really need nowadays, and simply sleep better at night. But to keep our gut flora thriving, to really make it a place of, of good bacteria that will help you through life, you need to have the, type, the good types of foods, exercise the right amount, sleeping the, right, the proper hours um, of sleep and keeping those stress levels in check. But I wanna talk about food at the moment. And when it comes to foods, we must 
we must, and I'm emphasizing, Tara, we must have a huge variety of plants. And I'm going to stop here for a moment to just clarify that having plants in our everyday diet is the cure to major inflammations in our everyday lives. So this, I think, is huge. And what other foods do we need to thrive and brighten our moods and give us the energy throughout the day? I'm going to list a few foods out. I apologize if it's going to make you hungry, but here we go. So healthy fats, avocados, olive oils, um, olives, all these healthy fats are the base, like, what would make would give you the energy it aids in weight loss it lowers heart risk diseases bad cholesterols so a lot of people identify fats being bad but it's actually the complete opposite and i'm talking about healthy good fats here we need more nuts and seeds for our heart for our it's a it's a powerful punch of minerals and vitamins bone broth i cannot express how important bone broth is, especially now that it's getting uh, the cold season is starting. It's very immune boosting and it, it also renews your cellularness, like your, your cells within get renewed. Um, my favorite, dark chocolate, uh, a powerful, powerful antioxidant and reduces heart diseases bring it on, you know, have, enjoy your dark chocolate, get, a, you know, get rid of the fake, the sugars and the fake chocolates out there. Another favorite, and I know it's your favorite too, Sara, mushrooms, um, a very, very powerful antioxidant. And when, when we say antioxidant, we are, are, it's the good stuff that fights diseases and cancer. Um, this is what we mean by antioxidants and, and um, mushrooms is one of them. Then we move on to eggs. And this is a point that I'm just going to uh, dig a little bit deeper here because I've always heard the battle between, should we eat eggs? Should we not eat eggs? Is it a form of dairy? Is it not? So on and so forth. Eggs is very, very good for you, but you need to make sure that you're getting the right type of egg. And the way that you would know that is from the color of the yolk. The orange or the yolk, the better, the healthier the chicken was. And what that means is nowadays you go to the supermarket and you find a lot of people um, buying the free ranged eggs. Just because it's written free range doesn't actually mean the chicken was very healthy. And what I mean by that, it's, be, it's about what the chicken eats. So you can have a free range chicken that's eating wheat and corn top allergen foods that can be passed on to the humans where they would blame it on the egg that they're allergic to the eggs but it's actually the type of food that the chicken ate that's giving you the allergies what chickens need to eat is more greens and insects this is where they thrive and this is how they're healthy so we're looking at pasture raised eggs so when you crack that egg open and you see that beautiful orange this is what you're looking for. But if you find it to be more towards the yellow and dull yellowish side, ditch the eggs. These are not the ones that will make you, doesn't have the nutrients that you need at all in your body. So I hope that kind of helped out here um, when it comes down to the battle of the eggs. Um, the next thing is your omega-3s. I mean, I can't explain how important fish is, but yet, we, I know that there's a lot of vegans out there and so on and so forth. So, but there is a lot of great supplements that will make up for your omega-3s. Um, but for the ones who do eat fish, this is very important because omega-3s also for parents who have children with ADHD, omega-3 has been proven to help children come over um, uh, ADHD through omega-3s. So this is something that's really, really important to, to, to mention. Um, as well as we have our grains, all right? Powerful punch of nutrients, proteins, antioxidants, vitamins. I can just keep going on and on and on and on. But when we're talking about whole grains, we're not talking about flour, all right? Because the more you grind something down, the more nutrients it gets, gets lost. So we're sticking to the whole beautiful uh, grains. And of course, beans. 
a beautiful bunch of colorful beings that are very, very important uh, to, to, to all humans, especially the pregnant woman, because it has a high amount of folate in there, which is great for growing uh, babies. Um, mentioning that, I want to talk about animals and animals being raised well. Um, you know, there's always the battle between should we eat meat or chicken and so on and so forth. Um, if you can find a good source of, of good treated raised animals, then this is something that's great and you would definitely go for and not worry. Obviously, we don't want to hear, you know, eat overeat, but um, I will explain the 80-20 rule um, as well. Unfortunately, it, we don't come around the great, very good raised animals a lot. Either they're very, very expensive or they're not around uh, as much as we have in Kuwait. So there's something called the 80-20 rule that I love to play around. When you don't have a really good source of um, animal products, you must fill your plate with 80% of it being plants, uh, all forms of vegetables and so on. And the 20% would be your protein coming from your animals. The, the reason I say that is because the 80% of the plants will detoxify the 20% of the meat easily uh, because it's such a small portion, enough for the, the plants to take over. Um, so this is something that I believe is really important. Everyone should look at it uh, in their daily lives, at the 80-20 detoxifying uh, type of, of, of foods. And of course, we go to the no-nos. I mean, as much as you can, people need to stay away from the sugars and the really bad vegetable oils. Everyone's just doesn't understand that canola, vegetable oils, you know, corn, et cetera, et cetera. These are actually really bad for you. Um, so we try to stay away from the package, the processed as much as possible. Again, playing with the 80-20 rule here where 80% of your time you're eating well and those 20% you can just enjoy. You know, so we're not telling you not to eat it. We're just saying eat it with, um, you know, mindfully basically. But saying all of that as well, there is also an idea what as much as you eat really good nutrients, uh, nutritional foods, not all the time do your body gets all the nutrition that it needs. So there are days where we will need high quality supplements to make up for our deficiencies. And that is absolutely fine to do. Um, so now that we kind of looked at food. Do we have any questions about food before I move on? Because I'm going to move on to something completely different now, other than the food aspect um, of being healthy. Do we have any questions about that or are we okay? I just have a, I'm curious to know, you mentioned previously about the dairy and a lot of people being lactose intolerant and not knowing that they're lactose intolerant. And you mentioned getting off dairy, but a lot of people when they get off dairy are, they miss that dairy or that substitute. What would you recommend people to try? Absolutely. Very good question. Thank you, Sara. Um, honestly, when someone, let's say, really wants to eat dairy, I mean, we all crave it. It's something that is, it's soulful, I can say. You always need to find the local and the, and the short shelf life types of dairies out there. You don't want to get the ones that are packaged and can sit in your fridge for a month and nothing would happen to it. You need to find the ones that really don't have a long expiration date. The more local and fresh your dairy is, that means the less preservatives, um, the less additives, and it's uh, better for your gut. You know, like for instance, we have yogurt and it's, you know, they say it's filled with probiotics and it's good for you, but not the ones that can last for a very long time. So we always try to find local. I love, and we have wonderful, wonderful local companies um, in Kuwait at the moment. So definitely that would be your go-to. For people, let's say, who are trying to get off of it and always say, but I, you know, I love milk in my coffee. This is one thing I've always heard a lot of people say. Um, when you want to get off milk in your coffee, there is 
a huge variety of plant milks out there that you can try. Each one have a distinctive taste. So you would have to try every single one until you find your favorite. But from everyone that I've known that moved from um, milk, that is from the cow or a goat to plant-based, some they've always eventually found something that they really loved. So this would definitely be my, my um, advice when it comes down to dairy. And also regarding, you mentioned that plants are really important for our gut health and our overall well-being. So yeah. what are uh, ways that you think we can incorporate more plants into our daily diets? Any more plants creative? into our daily diet? That yes. I've started off with something very simple, salads. It's simple. You don't need to do much. Just put a bunch together, olive oil, lemon, salt, pepper, so simple and so yummy. And the, the most important part is try to get as much leafy greens as possible. And when we're talking about leafy greens is that when you're going for your greens, um, like don't go for the ones that are less green. Like you have the cabbage, the lettuce, they're great, but you wanna go for the spinach, the rock, uh, um, Jarjir, basil, all of these really dark leafy greens types of um, plants into your diet. And that would boost your detoxification and um, your, your nutrients in your body by, by so much. So salads is always the go-to. Roasted vegetables is amazing as well. And no one says no to that, you know? So um, I would say these are the two ways that I would, I would go. I would go roasted vegetables and salads as my go-to to introduce them to your um, uh, diet, you know, every day, trying to put a new diet every day. <laughs> I really liked when you mentioned that 80 20 rule because a lot of people think diets are a one size fits all and they would go for that. And having that 80 20, I think, is a really nice one. So, what would you recommend for someone trying that 80 20 approach when combining all the different, uh, the, so the healthy fats, the whole grains, all of these good stuff? How would you recommend? How would I recommend as, as, as an application in their diet or trying if they're new to this concept? Um, I've been working on this actually with my clients now, the 80-20 rule majorly. And um, I just always try to say, eat your colors um, as much as you can. So always try to have a minimum of three different colors in your plate. So you'll have your greens and maybe you can have your uh, reds where you have your beetroot um, and then, um, you can have, let's say your whites where you can have your potatoes and so on and so forth. So always go with colors as much as possible. And then you can add your 20% of having your protein depending on what it is. Always boost it with a little bit of fiber, like have hummus in there um, to really help you get filled up. Because a lot of people say that when they're on plant-based, they tend to eat more, which is true. You do eat more, uh, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be gaining weight. It just means that your stomach is able to consume so much plants without actually having to gain so much weight. Um, so I would go eat your rainbow as much as possible. That's the way that I would uh, try to push them in that direction, if that. Yeah. Thank you okay. for sharing us. You're so welcome. Okay. Anyone else would like to ask any questions before we move on to the supplements part? Actually, it's not supplements. We're moving on to something else. <laughs> I think we can get to the, move on to the next section. Okay. And perfect. if any of you has any questions, can we can also answer them at the end of, after we're done from the talk part. Definitely, definitely. All right, so we talked internally. We talked about everything that's going into your body. All right, now I wanna talk about and take a look at what our bodies needs to thrive. So we're taking a step outside, all right? And we're talking about an off-plate nourishment. Off-plate nourishment is a major, major, major aspect in all health, all health coaches. This is what we thrive with. We look at 
what you're surrounded by, by how it affects your mental health, your emotional health, and your well being. And we have something called the circle of life. And the circle of life dry is, is, is basically what you're surrounded by, from your joy to home cooking, to your friends, to your career, to your relationships, your home environment. We literally dissect every single part of your life to try to make, you know, to, to figure out what things are thriving you and what things that are kind of putting you down. Now, many ask us, what does an off-plate nourishment have to do with the underlying health? And my answer to that is always, always everything. Um, taking a look at the circle of life, I extracted three examples that I'm going to go through as a health coach to show you an example of what it is to, to what it means to have um, off plate nourishment. The first one I'm going to talk about is the home environment, for example. So the home environment, we can tackle it through an emotional state. Like, does your space make you happy? Does it energize you or does it drain you or put you down? And if so, as a, as, a, as a health coach, one of my ways would be we need to do some spring cleaning. And funny enough, everyone I know have done spring cleaning during these lockdown because they realized that the amount of stuff that they had once they actually settled in home and were not able to leave was very overwhelming. And it really causes a lot of tension and heaviness in, you know, in the way that you feel. So when you do a spring cleaning, the first thing everyone mentions is that it is absolutely, it feels wonderful and they feel light and so on and so forth. The other way of looking at the home environment is basically taking a look at your, um, um, the way that your home the, the, let's see the cleansiness of your home not if it's clean obviously you know we're not talking about the cleansiness in the sense of is it clean we're talking about the types of uh, products that you use uh, so we can take a look at the the cleaning products the scented candles that we talked about earlier the air fresheners these are all types of um, stresses that really affect someone without actually knowing, hence the inflammation that we talked about. So one way that we would, uh, the one goal that we would ask someone to do, sorry about that, is that we would say, get an air purifier, number one, and number two, um, change your products, change the, the toxic products that you're using in your home. So that's how we would look at when it comes down to the environment, uh, your home environment. Then we'll move on to your social life. And here it's, social life is it's either it makes you or it breaks you, you know? You, you, are you surrounded by people that you trust and love and give you comfort? Or, you know, are you around people that, that let you feel down um, or so on and so forth? So, you know, so for as, as a goal, all right, I would, you know, for someone during this lockdown whose fear of going out and so on and so forth, and you had a lot of that. One of the goals that I did was make sure you, you, you get out of the house and you see those friends of yours because cooping yourself up in a home at this time, it really plays with your emotions. All right, so this is something that we had to uh, make sure that step outside, take a breather, you know, go out, see your friends, make sure the circle is small. We don't want to talk about that. We're not going to do that, but we know what the rules are. And the other aspect of social life is, are you a type of person that keeps things inside? Do you boggle things in, coop yourself up into a corner? When I see that in, um, in a client, the first thing that I tend to to do, the first goal is that I need them to reach out to somebody. So one of their goals is speaking your feelings out, getting someone that you trust, a family member or a friend, and just going having coffee with that one person and getting things off your chest. The, the one thing that, that's, that really gets to, to me is that when someone thinks that being alone is good for them for a long period of time. It's actually not. And this is where social life comes in when it comes to off-plate nourishment. The last um, 
example I'm going to give you is the physical activity. And when it comes down to physical activity, I'm not talking about I'm going to be a gym mania, I'm going to hit the gym all the time. No, we're talking simply about the importance of movement. And movement is... I can't stress enough how important it is for you to move. And what I would ask the clients, you know, what does your daily movement look like? Are you the type that takes the stairs or do you take the elevator? Do you park very close to the door or do you park a little further away? So one of the goals would be, you know what, for the next week, I want you to take the stairs three times if they're the type of person that doesn't really do much movement. So we don't jump in and push this person to go on onto the gym. No, we just start very slow and just build up um, movement for them. And the other way of incorporating movement as well is that we tend to ask them to do, I, I need to move this little guy. See, yes, um, is a, we do morning salutations, you know, like do it three times a day or do a hit program where it could be anywhere from three minutes, three minutes only up to seven minutes of movement where your heart is pumping, you're sweating. And as we know, your, um, the, the largest organ in your body is your skin. And this is a huge detoxifying thing. And especially where you're increasing your um, mitochondria. So basically, you know, when you have some people that says, the lazier I am, the lazier I get, this is an actual scientific fact <laughs> that if, if you sit on the couch for a long period of time, you will keep getting lazier and lazier. The mitochondria basically is a cell in your body that is awakened um, and it, it gives your cells energy. And the only way to awaken this mitochondria is by movement. So the more movement you give your cells, the mitochondria pumps up the energy and gives you more energy. So that's why movement is so, so important. Um, and one thing that I also want to emphasize on when it comes to movement is there's a lot of people that are very depressed or they have anxiety and, um, and they, they don't realize that movement plays such a big role in their health um, that there's a saying where it goes, movement is the most potent and underutilized un antidepressant. The feel good endorphins that can simply elevate one's mood naturally instead of going to a doctor and getting your antidepressant pills, step outside into nature, just a little bit of sweat, you know, break that sweat a little bit and that alone will, in, you know, increase your endorphins and you will, you will guaranteed feel much better than you did five minutes ago. So um, this is where also it's very important to play the, um, the, the, the role of physical activity on, on one's mood. Here, I wanted to elaborate on how important off-plate nourishment is. In as health coaches, we look at off-plate nourishment as our primary number one. Um, it's the most important. We call we we call the off-plate nourishment primary, and the foods that we consume secondary. And there is a big reason for that. And I'm gonna show you two different cases and how what I'm mentioning at the moment plays this vital role. Um, so you basically have, I'm just gonna to try to move this little bad boy to the other side. Yes, perfect. All right, so we have two different cases here. Um, you have the he's so fit or she's so fit kind of person eats healthy um, all the time. And you have the, he doesn't eat so well um, and he is a bit overweight. So we have two different cases here. So just as for fun, really quickly, which one do you think um, maybe is the non-healthier or the healthier person? If just by taking a look at this, generalizing this video, you know, those pictures. 
I think a lot of people would say that, you know, definitely the guy who's fitter, you know, but here I want to elaborate a little bit. I had, I have heard a lot of comments from a lot of people that are very shocked when they find out that someone who is very fit and eats healthy gets seriously, seriously sick. And this is where I need, you know, we need to take a step back and look at our off plate nourishment. One thing that I, I say, and I say it all the time, is you can eat all the right foods and take all the supplements, but if your mind and your heart is not in the right place, neither will your health be. It was proven by scientists in Harvard about two decades ago that 70 to 80% of our diseases have come through from our minds and our thoughts. And I think this is huge. And this is where we bring on our second little guy here. Um, he doesn't eat so well, but lived up to his 90s. Why? Simply because he, uh, there, is, there are, before I move on to why, there are these blue zone areas around the world where they are known to be uh, the health, not the healthiest, but let's just say the people that lived the longest in the world. And the reason was once they sent people off to live with them to realize why are these people living for so long, they realized those people were eating pastas, they were drinking their wine, but yet lived for so long. And the simple answer to that was happiness. And they were surrounded by loved ones. They had a strong knit community and wherever, whatever they did, they did it together. And this is something that everyone needs to realize. Your mindset is everything. And this is why I felt like the off uh, nourishment is something that, off plate nourishment is something that's very, very, very important to talk about. Now to come to the end, I know that I've been blabbing, 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 um, how to improve your immunity. So if I were to give a range you know, a general um, tip to everyone and to just getting better. This is what I would say. Number one, exercise. It boosts your immunity. It boosts your mitochondria. It's a powerhouse um, to your digestive system. Um, and it just makes you feel better, simply. Hydration, something that I'm trying my best to do, um, but it's also something that helps prevent infections. It, it curves your hunger, uh, regulates uh, temp your body temperature, improves sleep. Um, sleep, something that everyone needs to do minimum of seven to eight hours, not more than nine. Uh, that would be a little too much, but every night of good sleep is very vital to your uh, well-being and your immunity. Um, also eat more whole foods. I can't express having more plants and fruits into your daily diet is super, super, super important for your immunity. And then self-care, you know, taking time off for yourself to really step out of the stress life that you have, the busy life as mothers, as, as bosses, as entrepreneurs, as all the types of people that are out there, everyone deserves some time off to themselves. And when we mean time off, we're talking about um, something that gets your mind off of the hustle and bustle that you're going through every single day. That alone, whatever it is, is a form of self-care, as long as it just gives you some form of peace of mind. Writing a gratitude journal every day, writing down three things before you sleep, was proven that after three weeks of consistent writing, it actually was proven that it changed your mindset to seeing things in a brighter and lighter way. I think I'd get start writing tomorrow because this is something that really, really changes your mindset. And challenge yourself. We humans evolve to become better. Always find something that's a bit scary to you and you know, you're know you not sure if you wanna do it. This is, if there is something that you wanna do and it scares you, do it because it will change you. Whether you failed at it or you did great, at the end of the day, you come out being a better person than you are. And one of my favorite ones, is you can't see it, but it's your mindset. 
laugh, laugh things off. Life is short, it's delicate. Make sure to take things lightly and learn and enjoy this. Um, you know, enjoy your journey as much as you can. Life will come and slap you on the face every now and then, but it really all ends up in your mindset and how you perceive these things. So moving on to supplements, this is my last part. It has been proven that your nutrient status determines how well you fight off infections. So, and if any form of deficiencies if you have any form of deficiencies, it can worsen your outcome of fighting these infections, especially now at this time of age. We know that we're at a time of a pandemic, we need to really boost our, um, our, our immunity. And one way is to fix your deficiencies and fixing them means strengthening your immunity. Um, and as a health coach, I always ask my clients to, you know, at the beginning to take, um, to try to take a blood test to see the deficiencies. But these supplements that I'm going to mention at the moment are for the general masks. Everyone should get on them. And vitamin D is one of them. Um, and one to two billion people are either deficient or insufficient in the world. And more studies happening now have found out that most of the people that got seriously ill or passed away from COVID, one of the top reasons was the deficiency and or insufficiency of vitamin D. And this is major. In Spain as well, they found that 80% of their patients who, were, uh, who passed away were deficient in vitamin D. And that is a big number. Um, however, to activate, to get your vitamin D levels, uh, your vitamin D going. So if you're taking supplements of vitamin D, if your magnesium is not intact and you're deficient in your magnesium, your vitamin Ds will not be uh, taken in. Like it won't, um, it won't activate, it won't absorb. And talking about magnesium, 86% of humanity, the globe, the world are deficient in magnesium. So I think I would get on those right away. Um, and there is no harm in taking these even though you're fine. So you can start them today, a few weeks from now you take um, a blood test and if, if, you're, if you're fine, then you can just immediately get off of them. Probiotics is huge. As we know, it's about your gut. It makes you feel better. If you've never been on probiotics, start, start low, start with 20 to 30 per, uh, billion and then work your way up to around 50 to 60. Um, and the last one is, uh, sorry, vitamin C. Um, it helps with the development, uh, it, it, it repairs body tissues and it, it allows for proper immune function. So these definitely would be the supplements I would say anyone needs to get on. And of course, take a blood test to, um, to figure it out. Now, if I know that we don't have much time, but I'm going to go through this super, super fast so that you can end up with any questions is that if you do have COVID, these are the things I won't go through them right now and explain to them, but turmeric, elderberry, quercetin, uh, grape, um, grape seed extract, zinc, knack, stinging nettle, and melatonin are all the must if you have COVID, you need to get on these. NAC, for instance, is, um, is it's the very potent um, nutrient where it, it attacks your respiratory. It, it, it relieves your respiratory system. And as you know, with COVID, um, it, 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 it attacks that. Melatonin helps with sleep. And it's been proven right now, you can read it everywhere in the articles that melatonin is gets you to have um that helps you get off of covid because of the lack of sleep and people are just super super tired that their body's not being able to function ending with a quote when it comes to longevity the goal isn't to live as long as possible the true objective is to live as vibrantly and energetically for as long as possible. So you want to be alive when you're alive. You know, you want to be vibrant and energetic. You don't want to be a slum. And that's where it comes down to and the end. It's not the years in your life that counts. It's the life in your years. So thank you guys. And uh, yeah, any questions? <laughs>
I would like to ask a question. You mentioned self-care and I believe self-care is really important for everyone. And um, because I know a lot of people might be confused about what is considered as an example of self-care that you can do for yourself. So Absolutely. Good. I mean, a lot of people tend, you know, like, oh, I'm going to take uh, some time off and uh, go, you know, get my nails done or go to a spa. That's that can be considered a self-care, but it all really depends on your mindset. If you're going to get your nails done, but your mind is busy and you're on your phone um, or you're just thinking of a lot of things, this is not a form of self-care. Self-care is taking back time for yourself where you're able to just forget your stresses that's going on around you. Either you can do some yoga, you can read a book, uh, take a walk outside, listen to your favorite music, maybe even cook. Any of these things can be a form of self-care. But as long as your mindset is in the right place, this is what counts as, take, as really treating yourself to, um, to, to getting off of your busy, busy mind, basically. That's the importance of self-care yeah anyone else has any questions about anything about regarding health anything regarding covering the topic so the question is what to do when feeling stressed all the time even when everything is going great okay that would be something that i would need to sit down with that person to see like i would go through you know like i said with the circle of life i need to go through everything that's happening maybe change their diets around add some superfoods in there to really help with the anxiety and the stress and try to basically calm themselves down um so this is something that's very bio individual i can't answer it as a general thing it's more of a very um personal type of answer so that I would need to really you know talk uh, to this person and see what's going on in their lives if everything is going great and they're still stressed then there is that there's a trigger and I need to find what that trigger is that's put, put, putting them off to being so stressed out um, but yeah definitely I would maybe one advice it'd be go for your um, your superfoods. There's a lot of beautiful uh, adoptogens out there that really help with lowering the stress levels naturally using herbal stuff. So that would be one answer. <laughs> and I know some some audience may be curious, what kind of uh, adoptogen supplements would you recommend people try to help with stress regulation? Okay, so we have like um, ashwagandha. It's, it's a type of uh, potent, beautiful, or, you know, um, adoptogen that really they've used for thousands of years in medicine to really help bring down anxiety and stress. But again, it's I need to know if this person has any thyroid issues or anything like that, because it can um, backfire, let's say. So it, 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 I really need to question, you know, have a talk with the person to really go into these the specific details, because everything has its ups and downs depending on your health. You know, so but um, definitely looking at, uh, at Ashwanga is something that's I would say. Uh, also, one of the audience is asking, where can they find ashwagandha? Um, I've looked for it and I found some really nice ones on iHerb. That they have some really good ones uh, over there. So that would be definitely somewhere where I would say you can find them. Worst case scenario is Amazon. I don't know about Kuwait and what they have here if they, it, with adoptogens. I haven't come across them, but I've heard that iHerb is, is amazing. It's fast, it's quick, and you know it arrives um, in, in good time. So definitely I would go for that option. Yeah. Anything else? And there's an, uh, there was an interesting point that you brought up, which was about exercise that could be unhealthy and how it can trigger stress. How is that uh, linked to that? And how does someone know if they're 
relationship to exercise is unhealthy? By listening to your body, if you at the end of the day, go to the gym and work out and come home and you are absolutely exhausted, um, this is a sign that your body is, uh, is, is screaming out for help because there are days where you go, um, what, the, what the gym is supposed to do is supposed to really give you that boost of energy and makes you feel good and you're ready to, you know, attack the rest of the day. But if it's doing the complete opposite effect and it's draining you and you're not feeling so good after it, this is a sign that it's, it's, a, it's doing too much. And the other way is also your gut issues. So let's say you're eating really well. Um, your food intake is great, but yet you still get bloated and you still get kind of cramps. Um, if you're over exercising, this also it affects your gut. So we would also take a look at that and see how that's working for you. And also, you mentioned um, exercises that can be short and that can be in three to seven minutes. Is there any applications or any resources that would be helpful? I'm sure to try? there. I, I I have one actually on my um, uh, on my page on my Instagram page. I thought I showed a seven minute hit program, and. Um, the easiest thing that everyone is going to, I guess, is YouTube. I mean, everyone, uh, I'm not a big application, like I don't know the apps of the exercising and everything, but there are, um, if you put three minute exercise on YouTube or so on and so forth, you will find a major range of different types of exercises. And we're talking about HIT programs. So something that really gets your heart going. So it would be basically, let's say 30 minute workout, 10 second rest, 30 minute workout, 10 second rest. So it's on and off, on and off. And it's really easy. There are simple, simple moves for people who have never, let's say they've you know, exercising is not part of their daily regime, that there are moves that are so simple where you actually don't need any form of equipment and you'd use like basically like a chair and, and just have a wall and everything else is, is um, that's all you would need. So there's a range of options out there for anyone to, if they're looking for something like that. Anything else? <laughs> Anyone else would like to ask a question? And also in regarding to one of your questions for one of the speakers, um, also I, I believe you can find ashwagandha in some of the health stores here like Health Planet or um, results you might find it there. Amazing. Good to know. And also, she, uh, one of them, one of the audience has asked, uh, what type of protein should people focus more on? What types of protein? Should like, people focus more on? So we're, I'm guessing the question here relies on whether it should be plant-based protein or animal protein. This I would is... assume that in that case. If we... Okay. So yeah. yeah so we. So would... That's what she means. Is that it? it yeah. When it comes down to, you know, health and, and doing a lot of research and really trying to find out whether you should go completely vegan or vegetarian or, or, or so on, if you find good quality um, meats and chickens and fish and so on and so forth, they're really good for you. You know, the, the fact that we sometimes our, you know, we, our chickens are filled with hormones and antibiotics and that's hence why we don't try to go for them as much. And our beef is not always uh, grass fed, they're fed corn or wheat or so on and so forth. When you find food, animal raised right, enjoy it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Hence with a big side of plants. You know, plants is your go-to. But saying that as well, um, I always try to, when I eat meat nowadays, before I was a pure carnivore, I, you would have a steak with a side of broccoli. Now I do greens with a side of a steak. 
you know, so I would go for the smaller portion, make sure to always eat my 80-20 um, style. But when it comes down to your proteins from your plant-based proteins, plant-based proteins are amazing. You know, you can have them all day, every day, not all day, but like, you know, most of your meals, you know, you can have them, um, you know, enjoy them and have your meats as a condiment, as a, as a, a treat to yourself, if you may. So I, I wouldn't go and tell someone to go vegan, never, you know, like that's not who I am. And I, I, I believe that good raised animals are fine to eat, so. And one of the that's questions true. is, is heartburn related to our food intake? And if yes, how can we somehow treat it? Okay, heartburn, of course it is. It's, it is part of your diet. Um, so the way that we tend to try to cure um, heartburn because heartburn is, is an inflammation, right? So we know that it's a form of inflammation that's caused by the types of food that you've eaten um, or the types of drinks that you're drinking, you know, sodas, alcohols, so on and so forth. Like I would say to anyone, the cure is upping your intake of really good whole foods and really dropping down on the fried and the, um, the refined carbs and the, the sugars. If you do this major change into your diet, you will see, and I guarantee it, a big change in your heartburn. So acid reflux is not fun. Um, so definitely going and changing your diet will definitely help you with that. And also, Estate has asked, is air frying healthy enough to eat every once in a while? Air frying? Yes. Of course, because one, that there is no oils, and two, it depends also on what you're frying. So if you, let's say you're air frying because it's only using heat, all right, so there's nothing wrong with eating anything that's heated. Um, if you're heating up your vegetables and you want them a little crispy, um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. But if you're air frying, let's say, um, like crispy chicken, you know, I'd be worried more about the crispy parts than the actual chicken. So it really depends on what you're air frying, but definitely enjoy air frying. There is nothing wrong with that. And also I'd like to ask, because I know a lot of people, as you mentioned, uh, to a lot of people are lactose intolerant, so they're switching to, to eliminate dairy. And a lot of people think that dairy is the source of calcium. What are some other sources where you can cover your calcium needs through non-dairy options? Yeah. Leafy greens are packed with calcium. You do not need calcium from milk. It actually has very, very minimal amount of calcium compared to a handful of leafy greens. That is a punch of calcium for you right there. All the dark leafy greens and vegetables actually have higher calcium than the actual milk itself. So don't, you know, I would, I wouldn't use milk as my source and go to for calcium at all. Like I said, plants is the answer to all. <laughs> you wanna feel better, eat more plants. You want a mood boosting feeling, eat more plants. You wanna get rid of whatever it is, eat more plants. That is my answer to a lot of questions. <laughs> Anyone else has any questions? The one about the heartburn actually, because I just remember because I posted about this a few uh, weeks back is that I know it's not fun and it probably, you know, you'll think it tastes horrible, but if you put wheatgrass in any of your, um, your smoothies so that you know you can cover it up with uh, almond butter and bananas and so on and so forth and you just put a nice scoop in there so it'll 
the, the, the taste will hide away. Wheatgrass has been proven to really help with acid reflux majorly. So if you, you know, with obviously change of lifestyle, but, um, but that is also a booster to have something to add into your, uh, your daily intake to help out. Anyone else would like to ask any questions before we wrap up? I think so. We don't have any more questions. Hey. And thank you everyone for joining us today in the live talk. And thank you, Dalal, for joining thank us you. today and for all that great information. And it was great yeah. having you and with us today. And thank you so much for this amazing talk. There was a lot of information that was really helpful to a lot of people. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. And again, if anyone has any questions, you can, they can always reach out for um, any advice that I can give out. 